We're going to turn to Hebrews chapter 5 today. I'm going to try to get my eyes on straight. They do not like, they do not like tears. Um, last week we looked at the author telling us that the time to walk confidently into the throne of grace is today. So guess what day it is now? It's today. It's today, church. As we open the word of God, we allow his voice to speak through it, lead us, guide us, prepare us for the next day and the next day until it is no longer called today when we stand before him face to face. And what a day that will be. As you turn there today in Hebrews 5, um, as I was studying this, I was just amazed as I, as I dove in to Hebrews 5 and 6, what an honor, like we just sang about, what an honor and a privilege just to be able to have the Word of God so present, um, so alive, so able just to, to go to it. Anything I get up here and, and just say off the cuff or say in my notes will not be as good or as important as what your eyes are going to look at today as we look at and read scripture. The best part of what I get to do is encourage you to put your eyes on it and then help us to read it for understanding. That was originally the role of the high priest in the Old Testament, to help the Israelites walk in God's statutes. We're going to talk about the priesthood today. And have you ever felt the role for someone else to be that person that is responsible for helping them know God. Like really, without you, they wouldn't know God. Have you ever had that, that feeling, that weight? Because that's the weight of the role of high priest in the Old Testament. The high priest was a fallen, sinful person, just like everyone else. And they would look out at the 12 tribes of Israel, and God would say, you will stand in the gap between sin and death for them. So we look at Hebrews 5, verse 1. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God. To offer gifts and sacrifices for sins, he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. Now turn with me to Leviticus 16. Um, I think that's a very important thing there, guys. I don't think anyone grows up and, and says, I want to be a pastor when I grow up. Um, I want to be a missionary when I grow up. I think that's very much a call. That is God being like, you're going to do this thing. I need you to do this thing, and I've, I've put in you the heart to do this thing. Um, I'll never forget the one of the missionaries that we support here. At Open Bible, she tells the story about how she was going to be um, a nurse, and she was in her last semester of doing this, and she got the call of God so strong in her life that she walked away, and she went to a foreign land to be a missionary. Um, that's not something that you, you want to ignore. Um, as we go to Leviticus 16, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Exodus 28 because it, it bears context here. In Exodus 28, we see God choose from among the Israelites Moses' brother Aaron, who was from the tribe of Levi. He was to be the first high priest. His sons would be priests and their sons and their sons. And they were responsible for going into the tabernacle and performing the sacrifices and the offerings. Um, they would be responsible for going in to the Holy of Holies, 
uh, communing with God there for the sake of the people. It was a weighty, uh, weighty position because they were to be the mediators between God and the people, like we just read in Hebrews 5. They would spill the blood that would stand in place of the people's sins. And these priests knew as they were doing this, they needed the forgiveness just the same. They needed the blood just the same as everyone else. The thing that we want to make sure we highlight here is that Aaron was not perfect. Far from it. Neither were his two eldest sons who would end up getting struck down for taking liberties with their priestly duties. And it was shortly after that where Aaron had lost his two disobedient sons that he has to decide whether or not to step into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle to offer up the incense and let a cloud of smoke that rises up be all that separates him from the face of God. That's something that would happen once a year, and it would be called the Day of Atonement, where one man would go into the Holy of Holies and stand before God on behalf of the people to say, we still want to be your people, but we have sinned and we have fallen short of your glory, O God. So let's read Leviticus 16, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, who died when they approached the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron that he is not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover on the ark, or else he will die, for I will appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. There was just this this very thick curtain that separated the people in the tabernacle. Um, from the outer court into the Holy of Holies, and no one would go in there. Verse 3, this is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. He must first bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to put on the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments next to his body. He is to tie the linen sash around him and put on the linen turban. These are sacred garments, so he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. From the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. Then he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. All the other times we see in the vocation of the priests, they are really dressed up. Um, They have a a very expensive, bejeweled garment that they wear, that God had them wear to let the people know. It's like this this person, uh, their station, their role, it's important, honor it. Um, Except for here, when they actually step into the presence, God says, dress down, humble yourself. Let's skip to verse 15. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. In this way, he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites. Whatever their sins have been, he is to do the same for the tent of meeting, which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole community of Israel. So now we turn back to Hebrews 5. One man, year after year, called by God, told to first submit his own sin offering because he needed it, because he was fallen, And then he would make a sin offering for the people. It's very important, guys, that in our own spiritual walk, we get right first. We we submit to God. We take care of our own stuff so that we are able to be an effective witness. All through the Old Testament and into the New, these were just people called by God. And so often, so very often, it did not go perfectly because we are not perfect people, and God knows this about us. 
The priesthood could not be perfect because as Hebrews 5 and Leviticus shows us there, it was being run by imperfect people, men who needed to sacrifice for their own sins first before they could seek forgiveness for the people. But God had a way to make it perfect. What I love about the Bible is that it's such a perfect story of God's perfect planning and unconditional love. Hebrews 5, verse 5. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Jesus was appointed to the priesthood by the father, same as Aaron was. And the verse there calls to scripture, pointing to the psalmist in Psalm 2, where we see a beautiful messianic prophecy that tells us something just awesome about this God we serve. So Hebrews 5 there calls back to Psalm 2, verse 7. I will proclaim the Lord's decree, he said to me. You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance the ends of the earth, your possession. What does Jesus get out of becoming our great high priest? You. He gets to save you. He gets to sit at the right hand of the Father, intermediating for us, calling us home, cleansing us with his blood, and making us righteous to walk confidently into the throne room of grace. Let us appreciate that we do not bear the weight that was on the priests of old because Jesus is now our high priest. And we get the privilege of telling people that we can now walk into the Holy of Holies and we can look back at our friends, our neighbors, our enemies, and say, you got an invite too. Come have a seat at the table. There is a place prepared for you. Verse 6. And he says, in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. I can't begin to tell you how excited I am to talk about Melchizedek. He's going to keep coming up in the next couple of chapters. I will get to him next week. In fact, it's next week's going to be a lot of character study on who this person is. Right now we go to verse 7. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. This all comes down to obedience. Jesus submitted to the Father's will to be our perfect high priest, obeying and becoming the perfect sacrifice by dying on the cross. This is the thing that Jesus did that we could not do in the garden, where Jesus said, I don't want to do this, but not my will, but your will be done. Whereas in the garden, we said, I know I'm not supposed to, but I'm going to do it anyway. Jesus said, I'm going to do it your way, God. And he stuck to that. That's why he became the source of eternal salvation. He never knew sin, and he was obedient even unto death on a cross. Every day, even now, we are learning to submit to him to give ourselves wholly over to this God who would dare love us so much that he gave himself up for our sins. Verse 11. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word 
all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. That's four verses right there that say you need to be able to testify to this, to be able to teach it, the elementary truths of God's word. And this is the second time Hebrews has hammered home this point to the church. Are you growing past milk and moving on to solid food? Have you ever known someone that's been on a cleanse and they're just like, I'm on an all juice diet? Um, They become like different people. Uh, and, and I'll hear them, I'll, and I'll talk to them, and they just have this, just like, I've been on this for a long time. I just can't wait to eat something solid. I'm like, yeah, I get that. Um, do you actually know what happens to a baby that does not move on to solid food? They stop growing and developing the way that they should. It is a child's instinct to move on to solid food. If you ever doubt that, have you ever been holding on to a nine, 10 month old in your arms and you had a sandwich in your hand? You're holding on to them, oh, I have. <laughs> Here, here's what happens, the baby doesn't know uh, they, they don't care if, if it has pickles on it or if, or if it has mustard. They just know that's food and I want it in my mouth. Now, for the record, I'm not saying you should feed nine months old foot long Subway sandwiches. I'm not saying that. Um, but I'm just saying that a baby will start, you'll watch it as, as a baby grows and develops. It will start wanting to move on to solid food. Um, They're going to try to snag that sandwich. Have you ever hid the good food from your kids? What? (laughs) I'm actually going to answer that question here in a second. Um, You know what I'm talking about? You got uh, got your hands on some gourmet food, um, something that you wait until the kids are in bed, and then you break it out with your spouse to share. It's like, <laughs> I, got a, I got a lot of people who know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, no joke, my wife and I did that last week. What? <laughs> now, by using that analogy, our spirit wants to grow closer to God and start producing kingdom fruit. But our flesh will say, nah, this, this milk is just fine. And we got to tell our flesh, no, we need that solid food. We need to be looking at scripture like it's a big old sandwich we can't wait to digest. We should be going after the word of God like that. But how many times have you picked up your Bible and you haven't opened it yet and you're just like, I know I should, but... uh." feels like such a big commitment. feels like I got all these other things to do. And meanwhile, your spirit is just like, I'm starving, feed me. Give me that solid food. But then, also we can't have churches hiding that gourmet solid food scripture and giving us the basics all the time, or worse, little to no scripture at all, and just a bunch of spiritual sounding TED Talks. Churches can't shy away from the word of God and the hard parts of scripture. It should be front and center. Going through these Pauline epistles, we've tackled some stuff that has challenged me and made of some, some of y'all look at me real funny, like the time that we talked about slaves a few weeks ago. That's why it's so important to keep studying, to keep learning and growing beyond the elementary truths, to lean in, to ask the tough questions and look for the answers in scriptures. All of it is based upon what we read earlier, though. We sinned. We invited the terrible into this world, but God made a way through Jesus Christ, his son, to be our great high priest. So now we move on into chapter 6, which is going to challenge us right from the jump, but let's not shy away. Verse 1. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, 
not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. There is something amazing about a seed planted in the ground. Uh, I got to do an experiment back during my homeschool days. We had one of these clear plastic containers um, that we filled halfway with dirt. We were supposed to put a seed in. And you put a seed in just so where you can see it start to sprout and grow and develop. And I remember when I put it in that container, um, the dirt covered it and it didn't look like a living thing there. It just looked like a buried, dead thing. But then that outer shell, day by day, of the seed, it gave way to life. It put roots down that buried deep, while at the same time, it reached up and broke through the surface towards the light, pushing past the dirt that surrounded it and becoming something new. Imagine, though, if as the transformation began of a seed, that the seed poked its head out of the ground and it looked around and said, I'm not ready to produce yet. And then curled back into itself. And it did that over and over again, just popping its head up, getting a taste of the light and then popping back down and then going up and popping back down and over and over again, keeping retreating back into darkness. Hebrews 6, 1 through 3 is a continuation of that last part we just read in Hebrews 5. And it is saying, you got to move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. I've had the privilege of seeing this in our youth group. There was a time many years ago, back when Tristan was this big. Um, I'm just kidding, Tristan, you were never that big. Um, you're always, mm, this, yeah. Um, you gotta move past the elementary teachings. In, uh, in our youth group, we, we were always, it felt like we were always going over the same stuff over and over again. And don't get me wrong, there is a season for spiritual milk, okay? There is a season where that has to happen. But these kids kept showing up and so we began to really dive deep into Scripture, showing how the Old Testament and the New Testament tied together and how they need to be rooted in the Word so that they can know God and make Him known. And I pray that for everyone here, that you're in it, that you're growing, and that you are uh, in a season where you're moving past the spiritual milk and are now chomping on solid food, not because your pastor told you to. And that's the thing, guys. I say it, I, I bang that drum often and loudly. I say, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. But you should never be reading it because someone told you to. You should be reading it because you love God and you want to know him more. That's it. You want to know God more. And the, the way to do that is to get in the word and to talk to him. Hebrews 5 verse 4. Hebrews 6, verse 4, that was a test and you passed. <laughs> it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farm, farmed receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. In the Pauline epistles, Paul references believers falling away for a time. It's not a new thing. Being a Christian in this world is hard. In perspective, though, in our modern culture, is not, it's not as hard as Paul had it. I think we can agree on that, you know, with the prison and the beatings that Paul faced. But we still call it hard from time to time because we don't want to make people uncomfortable. <coughs> um, 
And our flesh will always think that Christianity is hard because we have to deny ourselves and pick up our cross and follow him. But here in Hebrews 4 through 6, clearly it says, for someone who has tasted salvation, who has been baptized in the Holy Spirit, who has tasted the goodness of God, and then at some point makes that choice to fall away, fall away, it's impossible for them to be brought back to repentance. I studied this at length. There's a lot of commentaries on this. We don't like that word impossible <clears throat> because impossible here, um, it's also used, uh, that word is used a couple other times. We're going to see it once more in this chapter, um, but it's the same impossible that says without faith, it is impossible to please God. This impossible means immovable. It, like it cannot be, it just, it cannot be, it will not be. Um, <clears throat> So the, the crux there is, what does it mean to fall away? Because if it's simply to sin after salvation, then it's impossible for me to enter the throne of grace. This is a very divisive subject, so anytime we get to a passage like this, we let Scripture define it. Turn with me to Proverbs 24, 16, and let's look at a very applicable verse um, to what we just read there in Hebrews. Proverbs is just full of so many good, awesome sayings, and, it, and, and it's full of one-liners. Like, as we're reading through the Pauline epistles, we see a lot of story, we see a lot of passages all connected together. Proverbs just has a lot of one-liners, like, this is how it is. And we'll just have a whole whole chapter that's just like that. It's like, here's a thing. Straight from the word of God. Get it. Live it. Proverbs 24, 16 tells us this. For though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. But the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. The righteous fall seven times. Seven was the number of completion in the Bible. When Jesus says to Peter that we are to forgive 70 times seven, he was saying, forgive to completion times infinity. So here in Proverbs, it's saying, if a man who is in right standing with God stumbles and falls and gets tangled in sin, but still chooses to keep rising again and again, to keep repenting, to, to turn back to God because they see the sin they're in and they're like, I don't want to do this anymore. God, I choose you. And they keep rising. That is a man that is still choosing to be covered by the blood. So to me, Hebrews 4 through 6 is all about like so much stuff in the Bible, a heart issue. I have a moment of hate or lust in my heart and I feel the conviction and I turn to God. I make it right before him and I seek to reconcile anyone I've wronged or I have ought against. That's me choosing to be covered by the blood. That's me choosing to rise up and stand. But if I decide that I don't need the blood, that I choose to go my own way and wipe it from the doorpost of my life because my heart has decided I no longer want to repent. I don't want to turn. And the conviction I just once felt at the moment right before salvation is now just this cold, numb thing. And I know God's good and I know I'm supposed to serve him, but I don't care. That's what this passage in Hebrews, I believe, is talking about. And I'll give you four people as an example, right out of Scripture. King David, who was confronted in his pride and adultery, public re publicly repented and turned to God. And then King Saul, who in 1 Samuel 15, 11, God says, I regret that I've made Saul king 
because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all night. And Saul has this history of being like, oh, I'm caught in my sin, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I'm still gonna do what I wanna do anyway. He never meant his sorry. He wanted God's approval, but he didn't care to love him, to obey him. Two kings that were told what they needed to do, both having fallen, but David turned back to God while Saul turned away and would not obey. You have Peter and Judas, two men, two men who followed Jesus, who literally walked with him, walked side by side with him for three years, saw the signs and wonders, saw Lazarus being risen from the dead, got to hear Jesus say in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commands. Both Peter and Judas stumbled and fell. Peter denied Jesus three times and wept. But when Peter heard there was a stone that had been rolled away, he ran to see. When he heard Jesus call to him from the shore while he was on a boat, it was Peter that dove out of that boat because he didn't want to waste any time not being at Jesus' feet, even though, even though he had so publicly denied him and had, had, had fallen. Judas fell. But instead of seeking Jesus' forgiveness, he hung himself. Judas sought his own solution for the way he erred apart from God. That's what Hebrews 4, 6 is talking about. A person who's chosen in their heart that even though they have tasted and seen, they're still going to do it their own way because they feel they don't need a great high priest they don't want the blood, they've turned away and do not obey anymore. And Hebrews 5 verse 6 tells us it's like they're crucifying Jesus all over again. Those that diligently seek God, though they stumble, they will produce a crop that is useful to God. How many of you want to be useful to God today? It's one of those gimmies. It's like, you know, anytime anybody says something like that, it's just like, me. Um, and if you're like, maybe you're in the wrong place. Um, I believe we all should want that. Do you want to produce a crop useful to God? If so, we turn to him, we submit to his will, and we follow hard after him by seeking him, loving people, and making disciples. Those that turn away, however... Though they may talk a big game, like the Pharisees in Jesus' time, they're only producing thorns and thistles that are worthless, and in the end, will be burned. If you're here with me, and, uh, or you're watching us online, and, and you said, Josh, I'm concerned because I feel like I'm becoming more Saul and Judas, and I feel so far from him right now, and I don't want to be, I have great news for you. If, if you have that conviction in your heart, if you feel that moment where you're just like, I feel like I'm becoming more numb, and that's concerning, that concern, that conviction, that means you're still Peter and David. Um, that means you still want to turn back. Saul and Judas didn't turn back, but I believe if you're feeling that conviction, lean into that. Seek God. Confess. Turn holy to him. Let him change you. Wanting to take that first step back to the, the Father's house is the first step. And the good news is that God doesn't meet you at step 20 or 15 uh, that's what I love about God. He doesn't say, okay, well, uh, you got to adhere to my checklist now before, uh, before you can talk to me, before you can pray, before we can get really serious about transforming your life. I need you to do uh, X, Y, Z, and all this stuff. He meets you at step one with a big smile on his face and arms open wide, uh, and, he, and he brings the peace and the joy <coughs> and the freedom from that burden 
that you have carried for so long. It's truly amazing when you get that chance during confession uh, to feel unburdened by trusting God with your sin. I remember many years ago, um, back around 20, 2012, I think, when I just came clean to my wife. I just confessed to her. I'm like, I, I have a real problem with pornography. I have a real pro problem with just looking at things that I shouldn't and I don't want to anymore. And it, it has a hold on me and I don't want it. And uh, I ended into a season, uh, 18 month long season of just really good accountability with another man of God. But I can't begin to tell you how this thing that I've been holding on to for such a long time, just confessing that, just putting that out there, it was. It was like this huge burden just, and I could breathe again. I encourage you, um, confession is this powerful, awesome thing. First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. When we confess, we feel clean again. That doesn't mean um, that there might not be consequences to our actions, but guys, I'll take consequences to my actions here on earth over eternity without God any day. Hebrews 6 verse 9, even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, to imitate those who, through faith and patience, inherit what has been promised. God is, he sees our good works. And I do, I think it's important that that's always something we, we keep from being a pride issue. We do good works because we are called to that. Not for the gold star, not for the check mark, not so that each other see. It's like, oh, what a good Christian they are. But out of love for God, God sees and he does not forget your good works. And he calls us to the same diligence to the very end. Verse 13, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. We got to be willing to wait patiently. Uh, what, what's the song say? Waiting is the hardest part. We don't like to wait, especially in today's society, right? We want everything now. We want our prayers answered when? Now. We want everything now. But I love that chapter. I love that verse right there. God swore on himself because there was no one greater. And God will do what he says he will do. Now look at this. Eyes on scripture. This is just too good to miss. Verse 16. People swear by someone greater on themselves. And the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us, may be greatly encouraged. Genesis 1, 1 lets us know when God speaks, things happen. Things come into being. He spoke and he swore by himself and he is unchanging. And he wants us to know that. We... Humanity might change our minds. We might think one thing is important one day and then just super 
not cool the next day. We change our minds all the time, but God does not. And it is impossible for God to lie. And so we run to take hold of the hope of what is promised. The thing that has to do with our salvation. The verb there in verse 18 that says fled means to flee, to escape a danger or a threat. We cannot run, we cannot outrun our sins, but we can run to the one who is our hope, who is our redeemer, who is our great high priest. And we don't have to run far. We just have to take that first step. Verse 19, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus meets us behind the curtain in the Holy of Holies that, according to what we read last week, we can boldly step into the throne of grace. So we thank you today for being our great high priest, Jesus. If you want to confess something after service today, like 1 John says to do, I really encourage you to do it. Do it today. Don't let sin rest unburden yourself, share it with a brother or sister, and let them pray for you and encourage you. And if you want to take that first step today, if you want to confess and believe that Jesus is Lord and follow him, do that too. And let someone know that you did that. And then pick up a Bible and start learning his commands. I really encourage you, oh, stop it. (laughs) This this means I'm going to pray. <laughs> um, I can't, even now I want to do it. Uh, I, I do. I really encourage you. Next week we're going to talk about Melchizedek and the story that we see back in Genesis and connecting it to what we're going to read here in Hebrews 7 because uh, it's going to go right into Melchizedek and who he is. Uh, I really encourage you to be there. So right now I'm going to pray. I'm going to bless us. <laughs> I love our youth group. (laughs) May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.